this morning I was playing and I was at the shuttle bay, right? Where you're, you're going to, you know, you kill them by hitting them with the exhaust. And I, and like, I got to that section and I'm like, oh, I got this. I, I know, you know, I remember how you're supposed to kill them and everything. So I'm like, you know, all confident and all these other <laughs> necromorphs also showed up and I got, I got totally killed. And I'm like, oh shit, man. Okay. That's some gotta, surprise for returning players. Yeah, be more careful next time. <laughs> Can you imagine working on a creative project for years, having it come to fruition and become a beloved classic? Then 14 years later, it gets remade anew, beautifully modernized and enhanced in ways that weren't possible before. Can you imagine being handed a project brilliantly designed by someone else and asked to remake it with fresh visuals and meaningful design improvements, all the while staying true to the beauty and spirit of the original? These are the circumstances in which Brett Robbins, creative director of the original Dead Space, and Roman Campos Oriola, creative director of the just launched Dead Space remake, recently found themselves. Welcome to Rise Above, an original podcast series by Ascendant Studios where we share insights and inspirations from industry-leading game developers. I'm Tess, and while I'm usually your podcast host, today I get to share this candid conversation between two masters of their craft, Brett and Roman, who are each responsible for their own version of the beloved space horror survival game, Dead Space. Was Roman nervous about the fans' reactions? Did the remake scare Brett? Stay tuned as Brett kicks off the conversation with his thoughts on the remake, and these two creative directors share insight into design decisions, the challenges they faced, and how they persevered to rise above. I think everything you've added to the game has been only making it better or cleaning up some of the like clunkier areas that we had and doing a better job at it. And it was funny because the one thing you added right away that I realized that I really had wanted in the original was the ability to go back and replay other decks to go backtrack basically. And we never got that. It was too late. It was too much work. And so we can only go, you know, level by level. And we had a couple levels that you do go back, but it was very scripted that you're going back there. But that ability to make the ship feel like one big continuous space is something I had really wanted. And uh, I was just really thrilled that you guys were able to do that. So right away I was like, okay, the game's in good hands. They have some good ideas here. And yeah, in a lot of ways, you're making it better. So it's awesome. Thanks a lot. But for me, it speaks a lot to the quality of the experience of the original because we had like no design document you had or any <laughs> speech you gave or all of that is lost, man. <laughs> totally like, like. <laughs> yeah, you guys are great. I wish I had been able to talk to you because I, you know, I could, uh, <laughs> could give you some of that. But yeah, I mean, you know, the pillars we had, you guys followed them to a T, the continuous camera and no real big cinematics or anything it all had to feel very fluid with you know the action and everything and you guys did that and you added a few cinematic moments but i thought they were totally appropriate and they didn't take away the other one was no obviously no hud no 2d hud everything had to be in the world projected in the world which was difficult i had to fight for that one because it was you know constantly like well, it'd be so much easier if we just did this or, oh, I can't see, you know, it's too dark and now I can't see my this or that. And it's like, guys, we let's stay, stay on course. We got to, you know, and then at every turn, trying to make the next room interesting. Like we always wanted to make the next thing. You're constantly, you know, introducing some, some little element that's just a little bit different and keeping the experience fresh all the time. And you guys have done that really well too. Um, I think, you know, a couple of the changes, the circuit changes where you go up to a thing and you can switch, I'm going to turn off the lights or I'm going to open the door and stuff like that. I saw that. I'm like, oh, that's really good. Like, that's, I thought that was a really great ad. That specific detail, it started because, so we're like, okay, so that space tree is scary and stuff. And when the lights turns off, that's the moment where it gets the best, obviously. Mm -hmm. One of the, the discussion we had internally was that feeling a little bit of frustration when it's purely scripted. And yes, you need this type of moments, but there was a little bit of that. And the next discussion was about how can we improve 
or enhance a bit the feeling that uh, Isaac is an engineer. Yeah. And we were brainstorming, and that's where that idea came from because it's merging those two elements. Like, yeah, you're the engineer, you're supposed to be able to do stuff with the ship, etc. And then that feeling of, oh, yeah, like I have to turn the light. But now it's, I'm shooting myself in the foot, but I'm, yeah, I know I have to do it because that's the logic thing to do. Right. And so that's the, the element that also that space did super well in other sequence of the expectation of what's to yeah. come. Yeah. You know that, okay, that, that next thing, yeah, mm, something like you, you open the door of a room and you're like, yeah, I know it's going to be bad. <sighs> <laughs> Yeah. And so that's your quick breakup thing. That's why we liked it. It's because yeah. we felt when you see the thing, you have a little bit that same feeling like, oh, no, what are they going to ask me now? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You mentioned something that was one of the big pillars was that Isaac's an engineer. He's not a soldier. All the weapons and you know everything, your tools need to feel like engineering tools, not like uh, guns so much. We had a couple of guns, but mostly they were repurposed uh, engineering tools. That to me, you know, contributed to the idea of him being out of his element and out of his depth and the player being out of their depth and being overwhelmed by the situation because he's not a trained soldier and he's just kind of making it up as he goes along. So that was a really important pillar. And then the big one was, uh, you know, dismemberment as a mechanic. And I don't know how much you got in, into the weeds with dismemberment yourself, but I did a lot of the damage tuning and figuring out how the damage would work on the necromorphs. And it was like super complicated because it was like, okay, I want like 10 shots to the body, two shots to the arm. Okay. So then that does 10 points of damage, but cutting it off does an extra 30 points, you know, like the, yeah, whole, you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the whole matrix of how the damage is going to work and, and then ramping it up as you upgrade and everything. It was we spent a lot of time on that. It was difficult. So that was really tough also in the remake because one of uh, the, the, the big pillars we had, it was being true to the original. Okay. That starts with when you play the game and you get the controller, like it needs to feel like Dead Space. And mm -hmm. of course, the biggest ingredients are the necromorphs. So when you when you grab that, uh, that plasma cutter and start shooting things, well, not only it needs to behave like you expect the plasma cutter to, to behave, but also quickly the player flagged to us like, you know, and, I'm expecting the same type of behavior, like two shots and that arm is gone, two shots and yep. that leg is gone and he's, and he's finished, et cetera. We're like, yep. ah, okay, interesting. But we did not add, like we had all the, the data that uh, that you left of the engine, but we did not add all the logics and stuff. So it was basically one of our designer, like trying, like loading inside the levels <laughs> in the original, like in the retail version of the shoot, game. Shooting, getting shooting to each point. Exactly. Yeah. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Okay, so that's three here. Shoot. And then, wait, so that was a bit, uh, a bit tough for that's us. Funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, it got a bit more difficult for us. It's because what we've added with spinning. So the reason being was at first, like, we were discussing, okay, how can we improve this movement? And quickly for us, it was like, yeah, we could probably add one section or two, but even if it was like 14 years old, this movement, in the original, like, it's really, really strong. Like, I don't see any game that has such a uh, quality in terms of damage, damage localization and feedback and stuff. So we're like, we're yeah. not going to get a lot by adding more precision. And there's yeah. just so much we can do in terms of behavior. So that's why we went with, uh, with peeling to, to improve on the feedback. At first, it was just to improve on the feedback for non-cutting weapons. Mm -hmm. And then we start to do a, a, bit more, a bit more with that. But at some point, we had the issue of, OK, but so I have to remove those layers here to shoot. Cut here. So let's say, okay, it's two shots of plasma cutter. First one, remove the, the, the muscles and stuff. And second one, cut the bone. Okay, cool. Right. But in the original, you can shoot, shoot, and that arm is gone. Right. For us, you have to shoot and shoot. Because if you shoot and shoot, the arm is not gone. You just build, build. Right. Right. And that was a big discussion in the team. And eventually, well, we're going to diverge a bit from the original here and ask a bit more precision to the player in order to. Right. to keep that original feeling of two shots, but you will have to be, to be more precise. But That's yeah, cool. that was, that was a big discussion. <laughs> it took some yeah. convincing. <laughs> the other thing I noticed when you kill an enemy, they don't drop the loot immediately. You have to shoot them again or stomp on them to get the loot out. 
Um, and I thought that was a good addition. I had to like still engage with the body. I had to like go over there and check. It's almost like checking the body. Um, and that, and then you, you get to use the stomp more in the stomp. The stomp's one of my favorite mechanics uh, in the games. And you guys really nailed that too. It just feels, it feels good every time you do that. That was surprisingly difficult actually to nail the stomp. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some of these guys were not prepared for, oh, wait, you, uh, yeah, it requires a lot. <laughs> a lot of precision, reorientation, hidden helps for yep. uh, hidden assistance for the player that you must not feel and stuff like that. Like it was yeah. more than just, yeah, trigger the things. And, uh, <laughs> it's going to be more <laughs> difficult, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. One thing I'm really, I was really happy about was you really kept the layout and the room design of the original almost 100%. That was something I personally did a lot of uh, was lay out the levels, you know, decide what the rooms would be, decide what the objectives were, how the experience would flow together. Somewhere in a box, I still have all my paper maps of all the, you know, the mining deck and how it all connects together and everything. I was pleased. I remember those rooms and they were identical. I've now played up through chapter 10, so I'm pretty far in. And it's, you know, you didn't really match the original in that way. So personally, I'm happy about that, that you didn't, you know, re redesign a lot of the levels or anything. Our first goal was to be true to the original. And so that meant for us, we should not make changes just because we feel like to. Yeah. And where we started, we had the whole team playing the game together and we we're taking notes and uh, finding stuff like, oh shit, I did not remember that. And how are we going to mm -hmm. recreate that? And from discussions, we were, there was some kind of consensus of, yeah, okay, there are big areas or big topics, let's say, where we would want to, to enrich the experience, modernize it. So what we ended up with, it's basically uh, three pillars of improvement for the game. Horror, and in a sense, more systemic horror. Unbroken immersion, like adding unbroken to, uh, to immersion and creative gameplay. And all the changes we made were because they were reinforcing one uh, one of those pillars, and some had a little bit of cascading effect, and required mm -hmm. a bit more chances than uh, than what we wanted to at first. By default, if we don't have a reason to change something, we are not changing it. A lot of the changes in level design came because we said, okay, so we want the whole interconnected ship. Okay, cool. So we started to literally pull out, pull all the collision geometry from the original game. And we had one LD that imported all of that in Frostbite and just yeah. tried to recreate the map that you see in the, in the tram. That's cool. match to us. He said, guys, we're going to have some issues because you see uh, <laughs> that sequence uh, in the atrium in chapter four where you see AG7 with all the meteors coming, etc., all the asteroid coming. Yeah, well, actually, on the other side of that, uh, of that window, it's the mess hall. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, ah, mm, yeah, okay. It was not built as a continuous space at all. It was, uh, it was well, level by level. Yeah. yeah. So lots of the changes in the first place were just to be able to arrange the different decks in a position that would uh, that would make uh, make sense. Yeah. That's and then add some yeah connection and then. Because also we change the OG, that's where we get like, ah, okay, so how can we create some uh, funny ways to uh, to connect the level? So that's why we went like from chapter two to chapter three, you can go outside or stuff uh, stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, most of the time it's like, yeah, it's, it works. Then, okay, let's keep it, it's good. <laughs> no need to change it. Yeah, no, the, the changes were pretty minimal, but effective. You did not keep the zero G mechanic. You took the zero G mechanic from Dead Space Two, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. What What was your thinking? I mean, I, I can understand it because I think generally players liked the Dead Space Two zero gravity a little bit better. What was your thinking around that? So, our thinking why we uh, we approach this one differently it's because of the pillar of the immersion and the pillar mm -hmm. of the the creative gameplay. For immersion, our thinking was like the more natural ways we feel in pop culture or any media where people, when you experience, you're thinking about experiencing zero, zero gravity, you mm -hmm. think about the floating elements. And yeah. for us, discussing in the team, discussing with some people outside of the team, the community council and stuff like that, we felt like, okay, there's a friction there. 
like the mm -hmm. way zero gravity behave, there's a friction. And mm -hmm. also something I, I haven't mentioned, it's in the pillar of being true to the original, the way we, we were defining it inside the team, it's not to necessarily recreate the original as it was, but recreate it as you think you remember it. Right. And right. for a lot of people, zero G was kind of blurry. <laughs> right. A lot of people thought like, yeah, no, I remember like uh, before the, just after the Valor crash, when you get to grab all the stuff and throw them outside in order to, uh, yeah, after, no, you were walking on the wall and really? No. <laughs> and put it, say, oh, that's weird. Yeah, that's weird. So one of the, the inspiration, one of the reasoning came, uh, came from that. And then the other one, it was like, okay, so now if we have a more, uh, a bit more freedom and a bit more free form zero G, it makes the zero G sequences feels really different from what you do in one G. Yeah. Because the way you move, the way you can actually perceive the environment. And so in terms of creative gameplay, in the sense of trying stuff around you, it adds a, a really big variety uh, element uh, to it. So yeah. We're like, yeah, okay, definitely. It's something, uh, uh, something worth it. Yeah, no, I think it, I, I think it was a good decision. I think our original zero G mechanic actually wanted you to have more of a feeling of helplessness. You had to look at that wall. You had to jump to that wall. And you had to commit to those jumps, and you were just hoping that when you land, you're not going to get attacked or whatever. So it was sort of, you know, trying to restrict the player in certain ways, and then adding like the vacuum. So now I'm running out of air and I'm trying to figure out how to like get to the next wall or whatever. I remember from Dead Space too, like that, the jetpack, you know, just that jetpack feel was really strong and it made those areas really feel different and unique. And so I think it's a perfectly good choice to do that. The, the thing for the thing of helplessness that, uh, that also helped us to, uh, to counterbalance the sense of being powerful and mighty when you mm -hmm. fly around, it's uh, how we made, a, like often when you zero G, the environment are much darker. Yeah. And yeah. a bit wider. Yeah. And we push a little bit on the sound from the, for the necromorphs. So mm -hmm. basically, when something happens and you're in zero G, you're like, where? Where is it? And you really have right. that sense of panic of, because now everything is not anymore. Yeah, it could be above you, it could be behind you. of you. Yeah. And yeah. everywhere you feel like, oh shit. And what we figure actually is like in later chapter, like in chapter 11, when you're in the yeah. massive anger and you need to try yeah. to mark your stuff. Well, people tend to land for the mm -hmm. fights and try to find the place where they're like, oh no, I'm going to be able yep. to shoot on them because it's too scary. It's too big. It's like I feel too vulnerable, too exposed when I'm uh, flying around with those things jumping at me uh, and stuff. But yeah, at first we, we had that thing like, oh yeah, but are we are we losing that sense of being exposed in zero G? And yeah, we, we had a little bit of uh, of questioning here. Well, what I liked about it particularly is one of the pillars of Dead Space, smaller pillar, but it was exploration. And in those bigger zero G areas, I'm flying around looking at every corner, trying to find every crate, everything I can get my hands on, because you guys also did the ammo scarcity really well and the health scarcity well. So I was very, very motivated to find every last ammo drop and every last health pack and everything. So you go into a big space like the hangar, you know, or like we called it the gimbal room, but the asteroid room on the mining deck uh, with the big asteroid and the things like those spaces are great for exploration too. You know, you're, you're searching around and Okay, so let's see. A couple of things I, I was curious about, just get your take on. One obvious one is Isaac talking. Now, obviously, Isaac talks in the sequel. You know, for us, it was a hard decision. You know, this is back in 2008, 2006 when we started the game. And back then, I think there was still a lot of games that were walking that line between, you know, do we want the protagonist to talk or do we want the player to really embody them and you know we don't want to run the risk of the character saying something that I don't feel, and so it, there's disconnect there. Okay, we just want it to be your experience, and you know coming off of games like Half Life, Half Life Two, and other games. But then we had this this challenge where everyone's talking to you and you're not saying anything, so that that is also a disconnect. And at the end of the day, we just said, you know what, 
let's have him not talk. Let's have the player really embody this. And, you know, I don't think there was a right decision there. I think both, you know, work fine. I think now seeing him talk in your game, those story moments flow a little better because he's responding to what someone's saying or he's emoting or, you know, doing something as he should. And I think now, now that it's, you know, 2023, way more used to seeing characters talking all the time and having their own personality. And we just as a player, we're much more indoctrinated into that. Back then it was a little bit more of a, of a discussion, you know, I think it actually today, it might even be weird if you never talked because we're just not used to that as much. I can tell you it was a big discussion. <laughs> <laughs> that was the one change we made where we were the, the most stressed. Uh, about in terms of mm -hmm. uh, reception and not only in terms of reception in terms of uh, quality of the of the end result because making mm -hmm. Isaac talk of course made us rewrite most of the diodes yep so it was quite a change I can tell you the producer were a bit nervous about it the reason we did that it's because early in the production we had a discussion we're like okay so who's Isaac in the remake like we are discussing all the cast, etc., whether or not mm -hmm. we wanted to recast some of the people, etc. And I asked the question, like, okay, who's Isaac? And what's weird? It's because of the history of the franchise, and uh, etc. Like everybody in the room was like, well, but it's it's gonna write. And I was like, yeah, but it's not in Dead Space One. It was so difficult for us to imagine Isaac as somebody different. We're like, yeah, it has to be Gunnar. And then we had the discussion with uh, with community mm -hmm. council. It was a bit, bit more difficult at the beginning. I should not talk. Blah, blah, blah. But then we we're telling them, yeah, but like when you close your eyes and you think about who's under that helmet, who's that guy? And they were, well, it's gonna, yeah, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. So we we're like, okay, so let's mm -hmm. first for the face, let's use Gunnar's face, and uh, for sure, like so, in a sense, like bring Isaac in that space. One once we had him, we were discussing with the lead writer with Joe. Joe Berry and we're like, we have to make him talk. <laughs> we have Gunnar, there's no way we, we don't use his voice acting. Basically, we put two big rules to guide us uh, through that. The first rule is, why are we making him talk? And the reason was, we want to give him more agency on what's happening. Our issue was like, so you're the engineer. Mm -hmm. That's the core fantasy of you, you're, who you are. You're that. Uh, 90s movie, uh, blue collar hero, uh, wrong guy at the wrong place, but managed to overcome yep. the odds. Okay. And we felt because of the constraint you had in making him a silent protagonist, you don't feel like you're the, the engineer expert because you're constantly being told, oh yeah, Isaac, go repair that by doing that and doing that. Go grab that stuff and it will help you to break the wall there on this kind of thing. Right. And we're like, that should be the Isaac idea. Entering the, the medical, and when he sees the gate, having Amon telling him about how he's going to bridge through that things and stuff, we're like, no, it should be, that should come from Isaac. We're like, okay. But then we were like, okay, but if he talks, aren't we breaking the, uh, the pillar of isolation? Because now you're not alone anymore. You're two, you're mm -hmm. the player and that guy. Because like, yeah, when you're, when you're a little kid, you go in the basement, it's dark, and you're like, where the fuck is that switch? Like talking, hearing a voice reassures you. <laughs> so the, the decision we yes. made really early on to, to protect that was like, okay, he can speak, but he's only going to respond. He is never going to talk uh, if it's yeah, not yeah. being talked to. We only break it like yeah. in two instances in the game where it feels really, really super weird to not have him talk. When we make him enter yeah. Nicole's office, not having him like look for her, and, and he just yeah. said, Nikki, it. That's right. it. Other than that, yeah, we try to really keep him just like, shut the fuck up unless somebody's <laughs> talking to you. No, I mean, I think you did it well because there's certainly a trend in games these days where the characters talk a lot and they can take you out of the experience by chattering too much or giving away things or, you know, breaking the immersion, saying something that the player is not feeling. So you guys used it sparingly, which I thought was good. Like if I was to make a new Dead Space today, I would I would have him talk because it's just now the trend is so, so much, it just feels more normal now to do that. 
it didn't come off as weird at all to me. You know, like I was like, oh, okay, they decided to do that. That's cool. That now the burden is just, well, the, the dialogue has to be good. You know, if you're going to do it, you got to make sure the writing is good and the writing is good. So yeah, no, that's cool. Um, I'm really impressed with how passionate you guys were about the game and how much you were, you know, it sounds like coming at it as fans. That's the reason why I moved to, uh, to EA. It's my first job at EA. Previously, really? I spent oh, way too much time at Ubisoft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was at the beginning of the interview. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah, no, but it's uh, at the beginning, it was supposed to be just a remaster. No, whatever. I'm, I mean, it's been, <laughs> so, interviewing, like, you get the guy. <laughs> Took a bit more <laughs> interviews. <laughs> like, no, really, like, that was the reason for me to uh, come. Like, yeah, I want, I want to be part of that. Uh, oh, that's awesome. That game of that experience. Yeah, it comes through, and, and I think you guys just did an amazing job. I want to talk about some of the places I think you really improved the game. I'm pretty egoless about all of it. So, like, I'm happy to see some things get better that I that even I struggled with when we were designing it. The whole uh, ADS system, the turret sequences that we had in the original game. It's funny because back then, so Dead Space did not have like a huge budget and we didn't have a ton of uh, focus testers, uh, user testers. It was mostly the team playing it a lot. And I was always like, you know, getting people into a room and watching them play. And because I was responsible among a lot of other things for all the game balancing. I basically put all the pickups in all the rooms and I did all the store prices and I did all the, you know, how often things drop. Because <laughs> it was on point. I can tell you're trying to reproduce it, but I, not easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and I was, I was winging it. I was making it up. You know, I was like, well, I think you're going to need some ammo here. So I'm going to put some more in, but I don't know. Like it, it, we didn't have a lot of data. So it was, you know, just sort of guesswork. And then the cannon sequence where you sit down in the cannon and you're firing at the asteroids, we all played it the same way. We all knew how it worked. All the, all the things spawned in the center of the screen and they made their way out. And really what you want to do is you wanted to shoot in the center of the screen and then it's easy. And I actually thought it was too easy, but I'm like, well, it's a weird mechanic. We can, we can leave it easy. And then the game came out and suddenly it was like everyone was complaining about that sequence. And what we didn't realize is people were not just shooting in the center of the screen. They were following every asteroid like this, and then they were getting hit constantly and, and dying, you know. And I'm like, oh my God, I fucked up the whole game because everyone's gonna hit chapter four and want to stop playing it because it's you know, it's you know, luckily that didn't happen, but um it was an example of like, okay, that's a pretty like it didn't have a ton of polish on it. And then I played your version of it. And I thought it was really clever. I wasn't constrained. You didn't put me in the chair. You, had, you know, I was able to still kind of move around and float around. Uh, it took a minute for me to figure out what was actually going on because I, I, I didn't read the pop-up well enough. And then, and then I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to aim with that. But once I got it, I thought it was really cool. Like it was a good use of the mechanic. And then when you doubled down on it with the boss fight or the second Leviathan fight later, like that really was awesome you know it, it and it felt very immersive it was better you know so i'm i'm happy to say that was like a, a thank you very much an excellent improvement. the excellent team improvement. struggled a lot with that one <laughs> it was really really difficult to uh to build it was at uh at risk for a long time <laughs> there were moments where like far, <laughs> we should not have changed that one <laughs> <laughs> because well, it's it's really interesting what you what you say about the canon. Because so for me, my personal experience was the sequence just before, like the spacewalk and the asteroid. Even if it's a bit frustrating in terms of uh, of balancing, I was like, that's the war moment for me. That's why I felt it was the the, the trailer moment. And then the uh, the idea sequence after felt like exactly what you're saying. Like it, it, for me, it was too difficult. So it felt as like. Not necessarily in terms of duration, but the the as a game breaker, I thought it was interesting. And uh, one of the first guys that worked on the sequence, well, while we were still discussing whether or not we would change it, he wanted to really keep the the gun. Because, and I think he had a good point, which is so it's a nice game breaker. And whatever game you're in, shooting big guns is cool. And one thing that's uh, 
that was for me. Like, so we spent quite some time really like checking it. And the way the whole little details of animations of the canon, the sound, how the shells move on the side of the screen, etc. Yep, it's yep. really cool. And for a long time, I was really afraid mm -hmm. that we were losing those elements. Like the whole pitch for me was, okay, can we merge the canon and the spacewalk? Like use the cool setting of the spacewalk because I think that's the the whole moment of the sequence, and use the 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 canon up there just to give you a, a gameplay objective in the in the sequence. It was not not that easy to pull off. <laughs> no, I think you're right. I mean, I think that like being outside having the asteroids bombarding you that's the really intense you know moment and to to marry that with the the canon gameplay because it still works as a game breaker it still it gives you something different that you're doing and, and trying to focus on which i think is super important yeah no i thought i thought it was effective i thought it was the, also the other elements that's uh that uh, went into the decision to uh, to go with a, a different form it's uh, again coming back to isaac fantasy where like okay the thing that was itching us was so you're the engineer, Hammond is the military guy, and is repairing the ADS uh, stuff yeah, while you yeah, yeah. shoot the guns. Like, and so we're like, okay, is there is there a way where you can actually repair the gun and use them at the same time to give again that sense of uh, of agency and right. uh, and job basically to. Uh, to, uh, to Isaac. So he goes like, uh, yeah, I could probably uh, repair, yeah, uh, yeah. retrain them to target stuff. <laughs> it's a bit bullshit, but it works. <laughs> no, it worked. It worked. Um, that's funny. Uh, the other um, element that I was happy that you guys really, I think you, you pretty much kept it almost exactly the same from what I can tell is the hunter. And the hunter was one of my favorite you know, pieces of design in the game. And I spent a lot of time on, on him in particular and figuring out, you know, when he should show up and all the sequences and how you're going to kill him or, or disable him. You know, it was a bit of the, the tyrant from the Resident Evil series. And I was a huge, huge Resident Evil fan. In fact, you know, one of my sort of mantras on Dead Space was, you know, this is Resident Evil 4 in space. Like if we, if we ever have a design question, go play Resident Evil 4, figure out how they did it, and we'll do a version of that. You know, like it was, because that game to me is one of the best, yeah. the best video games ever, and certainly one of the best, the best designed games ever. And so I wanted to do our own version of things, but it was such a great template, you know, to start with. And then, you know, I wanted to do some kind of, some kind of tyrant. That you know, Tyrant was such a great mechanic in Resident Evil 2 and 3 and everything back in the day. Like technically the hard part was the regeneration and understanding, like, okay, you're gonna, you know, you can down him, but he's gonna regrow and come back. And I remember like my my tech artists wanting to kill me because they're just like, dude, like how like is, where are the limbs? Where are they coming from? And we ended up like we would take the limb, so you'd knock the limb off, but there was like a little like limb that we would then scale up and and reform, you know. So it was like sitting in there, and then it would like kind of grow out, and we put a bunch of um, you know effects and everything to kind of cover it up and everything. So it's actually walking around with an extra set, you know, on all the dismemberment pieces that can regrow and reform. Stuff like that was just technically difficult for sure. But it was so effective and you guys you know did a great job and also i think you did even like a slightly better job of making him look di uh, different enough i always felt like we got him a little too close to a regular necromorph so you kind of had to do a double take to, oh yeah that's oh shit, that's that guy and yours really stands out with the red coloring i mean i think he was red in the original but like it for whatever reason he stands out really more. well yeah yeah he was bigger and everything it's a fun mechanic and um, having, you know, every situation where he shows up, you're just like, I got to get the hell out of here. Like, how, you know, so that feeling of escape. So I was happy that you guys recreated that, you know, almost note you know, for note. It's, it's uh, funny when you're speaking about uh, Resident Evil. So because I'm also a big fan of Resident Evil and one of our benchmark for that remake was Resident Evil 2 remake. And one of the things, of course, they improved a lot mm -hmm. on top of three seasons mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It's Mr. X uh, role and... Uh, 
what he's doing in the mm -hmm. game. And so at first I was like, yes, the uh, the 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 hunter is fucking Mr. X. So he needs to be as scary and present. And so that was our benchmark, uh, our benchmark at first. And that's yeah. how we try to uh, to use him at some point. So we have that system that is a uh, systematic at the the intensity director that's that spawns uh, dynamic events yeah. and stuff. And at some point, he was even supposed to be a. Uh, he was actually part of uh, of that uh, of that system, and we removed it from uh, from the system because we felt a bit like yeah, like you said, like his role is so strong when he's on screen, like it has it has such a huge impact on the on the pacing of a, of a sequence. That having him spawn kind of randomly in the ship, in a sense, put less emphasis. Yeah, that. it's less scary. Like you tend to get used to yeah. uh, to get used to him, and so we. You don't want to get used yeah, to him. Okay. Yeah, so we, uh, we pulled him back just in uh, in those uh, in those scary moments. But it was a character that we really liked in the team, so that's why we built the whole side content around the the guy where the whole story between him. And Mercer and our Mercer created yeah. him. And one yeah, that thing that cool. uh, that Joe did, the, the, the lead writer, which is uh, which I really like, she, she did a little bit of reactive dialogues. And when you kill him, if you have completed the side quest, and then you know like everything he's been through to become when he's uh, eventually became the hunter, it's not like it's not being like yeah, it's like here you go, Aris. Like uh, Mercer cannot hurt you anymore. No, like it, it shows a little bit of compassion to the character. Oh, that's cool. That's uh, nice that you guys did that. What's funny because, like this morning, I was playing and I was at the shuttle bay, right where you're you're gonna you know you kill him by hitting him with the exhaust. And I and like I got to that section and I'm like, oh, I got this. I I know you know I remember how you're supposed to kill him and everything. So I'm like you know all confident. And all these <laughs> other necromorphs also showed up and I got I got totally killed. And I'm like, oh shit, man. Okay. That's some you know, surprise for returning players. You gotta be more careful next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Yeah, I mean it, it's funny because as far as it being a scary game, you know, when I made the original, I'm sure you guys found this as well, but like a game doesn't get scary until you're sort of towards the end. What the polish has to be there, the audio, the lighting the flickering lights, the, you know, the timing of everything. And on Dead Space, it took a, you know, that kind of, kind of came at the end of the project. So there was a long time on Dead Space where I, I wasn't sure if the game was even scary. And then, you know, we started getting all those elements in, really putting a lot of attention to them. And we're like, okay, this seems like it's pretty effective. Um, but still for us, for the people that made the game, it wasn't that scary because we knew, I knew what was around every corner. I knew every enemy. I knew how to kill every enemy. And as we got to the, towards the end of development, I was really worried that we had a very short game on our hands because we could all play it on the team in like four or five hours and get through the whole thing. Cause we're running and shooting everything and moving really fast. And we did like a really big play test kind of towards the end. And I, I, it just totally shocked me because everyone that played, they walked and they crept around every corner and they were being really slow and were in jumping at everything. And I'm like, oh my God, we have a 15 hour game on our hands. This is amazing. Like, cause people are moving so slowly through it and they're scared. I didn't think I could, you know, really be scared by the game, but I did jump at, at times. And largely it was always like something busts out of a vent right in front of me the audio is just great like the you guys you know audio director whoever you, you know, your sound designers really really did a good job and audio was so important on the first dead space so yeah you get a necromorph usually behind you like you see him in the camera coming at you and you react and swing around and it's dark i think you guys used darkness more than we did so the flashlight was super important more important than in the first game it's effective you know it definitely had some great uh jump scares in it the one thing i didn't think i would feel was scared so that's cool. it, if you have yeah, that <laughs> that's a yeah. big, big thing yeah. thank you very much <laughs> uh, for us what you said about being disincentivized sorry i have to say for me in french but, uh about horror like, <laughs> it was it 
was a big issue for us also. Uh, we were really uh, afraid of not making something as scary as the original because for just everybody in the team and most of the people out there, that's one of the scariest game ever. And we're like, oh, yeah. it's to be as scary and I do it scary. <laughs> so basically our philosophy on that, it's uh, so first, early in production, we recreated one of the level, chapter two. And we spend a lot of time trying, because the, the timings you add on the jump scare, man, I get to tell you, they're amazing. <laughs> and it's fucking hard to reproduce. <laughs> like that timing, like finding the correct distance yeah. to make the thing spawn. What do you hear? Do you see it first? What's all that, uh, that succession of, uh, yep. of events to recreate? Wow, that yep. was hard. So that's what we did for a long time, just in chapter two, trying to really nail those, uh, those things. Okay. And we validated that with playtest. So we're like, yeah. okay, so we're when we put the polish, we've learned quite some some tricks by doing it. But when we put the polish, now we understand how to recreate the sequence. So that's, that gave us a bit of yeah. peace of mind, this during a part of production where everything was not there because we knew that when we had the focus, we were able to at least do it in the same way as it was done in the, uh, in the original. The one thing we add though, that you didn't right. add, that uh, reassured us a bit more, it's the, the systemic element of the sport. Because even in review of gray block things, we add some jump scare. Because we because you're so used yeah, to play yeah. the level and at some points you enter, the fuck there's a guy here. <laughs> and it worked. And we're like, okay, so if it works for us, yeah. probably yeah. it's gonna, Work in the end. But getting toward Alpha, again, we are really like with uh, Philippe Ducharme, with the senior producer, we are really scared that the game was not scary enough. And we had a big playtest by Alpha. Yeah. And uh, and we got the playtest guys coming back to us saying, Yeah, okay, so we've got some issues like uh, there's three people that uh, left after uh, after day one. Uh, we're like, Oh, fuck, it's that bad. He's like, No, no, no it's good. I will re remove their score, obviously. But it's actually good they left and basically they left because they said like oh yeah i enjoyed the game but uh, i'm too scared to play like i cannot possibly continue <laughs> to play so i'm sorry Touch me out. <laughs> yes <laughs> that's the best thing i've heard and at that moment we're like, okay that's awesome <laughs> we we were able to break a, a little but that's uh, yeah we were really afraid <laughs> that it was not uh, that it was not that scary, like, that it was not at the level of the uh, original. And everything you describe, like having us as dev, like going, like running through everything and stuff. And then I, re I remember, like, in yep. the first previews we did uh, with, uh, with journalists and stuff, seeing everybody like moving really slowly, using constantly the flash type. Like, oh, it works. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah put people in a dark room with a flashlight, they, uh, they get scared right away. It's, it's effective. Yeah. And then the other piece, which I mentioned before, which I think you really nailed. And I think the original nailed pretty well was the, uh, ammo scarcity, the health scarcity, the economy, the, the way the drops worked, all that stuff. We'd spend a lot of time on that, on the original. Uh, and like I said, I did a lot of that myself, just kind of, you know, balancing everything you know, that adds to the horror. You don't feel like you're overpowered at any time. You feel like you have just enough. It also, what I really like about that kind of system is it forces the use of multiple weapons because you just run out of ammo. Or like a plasma cutter's empty, I'm using the line gun. I'm using the ripper, you know, for a while. And, and so you're, you're forced to get familiar with the different mechanics. And I did like actually that on a couple of the weapons, I think you improved yeah, the secondary. Uh, the yeah. secondary attacks, yeah, you made some changes like uh, the pulse rifle. Yeah. I think ours had like a 360 attack. I was never really crazy about that one too much, so I liked you know the the grenade launcher. But the weapons, you know, you you stayed true to the weapons. Like the Ripper was always my favorite because it was such a weird <laughs> cool. mechanic, and it felt like a tool. It didn't feel like a gun. It felt real. You know, it's a weird kind of weapon, and it's so horror to have like a huge buzz saw that you're able to use. I still like, I love that weapon and you, and you guys did a great job on it. Like it really feels powerful. They react in a good way to it. It's not overpowered. Great job. Honestly, great job. Ammo on scarcity. Oh, and for basically resource tuning. 
that was really really tough on us like that's something we we nailed if you get it if, oh, yeah, if you get it wrong it's, it's players are fucked like they're yeah. just like it's, it's too easy so it's not scary oh yeah. it's you're stuck and right. we nail it really, really late. <laughs> that was on our on our top list of uh, danger, like uh, issues with the game to 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 fix. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, because it was constantly like either too much or too few. So when it was too few, people were constantly at the shop spending their credit buying new stuff. So they were all never being able to really yeah. upgrade the weapons. Or because we changed yep. a bit the mechanic, where how do you? Uh, Equip the gun. Uh, people were spent were constantly switching guns, not in between the guns they have equipped, but bringing a gun from the inventory in their weapon wheels. So, so it's yeah. it's a core. That's not funny. So yeah, nailing that was really difficult for the alt fire of the weapons. Basically, the the philosophy we had. It's okay. The plasma cutter is amazing, and we want to keep it as strong as possible. Yeah, and we don't want to nerf it to make yeah. the other weapons uh, more interesting because at first some. There was some yeah. talk in that direction. I said, no, no, <laughs> we're not doing that. It, it's uh, it's the signature. I mean, it's the signature of, us, of the game. You have to, you have to make the plasma cutter so cool. The, the, the IG we, we, yeah. we followed was to say, OK, let's change the alt fires to try to create more synergies between the alt fires and the powerful weapons. And so, for example, that's one thing with the post rifle is like, it's the second gun that you find, and in chapter two, it's the moment where you start to have big packs of uh, of slasher. So our philosophy was yeah. like, well, if you use a mine at the correct position, it's not going to kill a slasher, but it's going to peel a lot of slashers, and then it's going to be much easier with your plasma cutter to cut their limbs. So that's why yeah. you will want to switch from one, even if you're really good with the plasma cutter, just one mine of uh, pulse rifle and the it's uh, it's easier. Like, the philosophy we took to try to uplift a bit, not necessarily the the power by themselves of the weapon. Like it, I don't think it was a, a balancing element. It's more uplift the perceived power. The, yeah, the yeah. Reaper, that's like awesome. It, the, the brief was just a realization brief. It was like, so you imagine yourself, you are laser face, you have that chainsaw and you're cutting that thing. <laughs> imagine? Yeah, okay, yeah. that's how the player must feel. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> hey, that's, that's a perfect analogy. That's awesome, man. I just wanted to say again, you know, I think you guys, you nailed it. You really did a great job. I'm still playing it. I'm enjoying it. I think I'm a couple chapters away from the end. I knew I would be a fan, of course, because I made the original game, but I, I was nervous that it, you know, changes would have been made that would make it worse and i think the changes have made it better so you guys really really did a great job thank you very much i don't think you can imagine uh, how much it means for me and for the team having you say that i can tell you it's really really, really uh, like the best praise awesome man gets so, yeah like, thanks a lot i'm really so happy <laughs> Well, let them let them know. Let the team know that I I was um, I was very very happy with it. And I'm probably going to play it again. I'll probably try a harder difficulty and really get my ass kicked. So, well, thanks again, uh, and thanks thanks for meeting that uh, that game in the first place because it was amazing and it still is honestly. It's the game I'm most maybe one of the games I'm most proud of, except for the one I'm working on now. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to this very special episode of Rise Above. We look forward to bringing you more insider conversations with game industry leaders when we launch season one later this year. If you enjoyed listening, we'd love for you to rate and review the show. It helps so much. Please subscribe for future episodes. Check out our website at AscendantStudios.com to keep up with studio news and updates on our debut game, Immortals of Avium. Find us on social media as Ascendant Studios. You can also sub to our newsletter, The Stand Up, to get bonus insights from the developers we talk to on this show and more. We'll be back soon with more insightful, one-of-a-kind conversations with some of the most experienced and successful game devs in the world. For now, this is Tess, signing off. Bye.